Welcome to the Elvis Presley channel. Fame is hard as it brings different characters into the famous person's life. These characters could want to exploit this person. So the famous person uses familiar people to minimize exploitation. But does it really work? In Elvis's experience, it didn't. Were Elvis's best friends the Memphis Mafia parasites? Make sure to watch the video until the end, and if you're new here, don't forget to join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Elvis Presley channel. Are the Memphis Mafia a bunch of parasites? When you hear Mafia, what comes to your mind is a couple of wise guys tucking a Tommy gun into their large overcoats, with a cigarette tucked between their lips. But there was one Mafia that wasn't like that. OK, maybe a few members had guns and smoked cigarettes, but they weren't a criminal organisation. The Memphis Mafia, yes, Elvis's closest persons and staff, they were a stylish bunch, all because of Elvis. The stylish king had an image of being an exotic dresser, so it only made sense to compliment himself with sharp dressers too. His crew wore the best suits and had a respectable appearance similar to how mobsters dressed. They didn't give themselves the name the Memphis Mafia, but they sure trademarked it after it was given to them by a journalist, who gave them the name in a newspaper. The Memphis Mafia had a cool ring to it, and they kept it. Their role wasn't to collect protection money or any of that gangster stuff. Their role was to protect Elvis from the people wanting to use him because of his fame. Funny that they were the ones that used him for his fame. Some wrote books after he died, and others, like Jerry Kingsley, used Elvis's fame to become a manager for different artists. Notable among these artists he managed was the Beach Boys. They became what they were supposed to protect him from, and, in the end, couldn't protect Elvis from himself. They were just a couple of glorified yes-men. Elvis wasn't someone who naturally trusted new people, and was at heart the introverted boy he always was. A member of the Mafia claimed Elvis didn't like hanging around or meeting new people, but he knew he needed friends and a crew, so he used the people he had mostly known all his life as his staff. Although the group expanded to accommodate more people, including people Presley hadn't interacted with before. The Mafia consisted of the Smiths, who were his maternal cousins. His favourite cousin was Billy, and he was the closest to Elvis. When their group had all but disbanded, Billy remained. Jean Smith began with them, but left after a fight. She would visit the Graceland mansion occasionally. Junior Smith, like Jean, didn't spend much time with the group. He died, and his death shook Elvis. There was the Wests, which consisted of Sonny and Red. They served as security for him, and also drove him too. Elvis met Red at school. The thing was, Red bailed him out of trouble a few times. Presley never forgot what Red did for him. It appears that he met Sonny, through red, and the two hit it off nicely. There was George Klein, who was always pleasant to Elvis in high school. George didn't spend much time with the gang, but he was still close to Elvis until his death. Fike was the first outsider to join the people in the Mafia, as he wasn't connected to anyone Presley knew, nor did he go to the same school as Presley. They just got on well, but he later left to become Brenda Lee's road manager. Elvis made a space for his soldier buddies in his group, Joe Esposito and Charlie Hodge were his buddies from the army. Joe played the role of an accountant, and Hodge helped set up stages for Presley's performances. Jerry Schilling and Elvis began their relationship through work, but became close friends. Richard Davis became his stylist after he met Richard and decided he liked him. The list winds on, but despite the numbers, no one was there for Elvis in his final moments. They stayed in the building long after Elvis left it. Elvis died while the people who were his friends, confidants and staff continued to live life and continued to make money off Elvis. They never had to struggle for anything when he was alive, for the king was generous and fair to them. Whatever he had, they had. They had houses, cars and other expensive gifts. Not many bosses would treat them generously like Elvis did so it is unfair to see some of them drag his name through the mud because they wanted to make money. Forget his signature heart-melting smile. Elvis was a troubled soul, a grown child in a man's body. He had a childlike view of the world, which contributed to his death. 
But all through the while that Elvis was alive, turning his stomach into a haven for an assortment of drugs, where were the so-called Mafia? They had this mantra, taking care of business, or TCB for short, but why wasn't getting Elvis off drugs their business? Instead, some of these people dishonour his memory by writing books off their relationship with him to score best sellers. If anything, those books show how being a leech some of these guys were, although David Presley, Elvis's half-brother, wasn't an early member of the Memphis Mafia, David was still trusted enough to work as Elvis's road bodyguard, and that is how it worked for Elvis. The core of his group weren't outsiders, they were people he knew before he became a star, people who in one way or the other impacted him positively, no matter how little the impact was. His core group was made up of his family and friends, and in a way they all let him down. So David, who was supposed to keep everything that went on with Elvis secret, wrote a book about Elvis's final years. Remember, David began to go with his brother on tours in his late teens, serving as a bodyguard. So he was privy to a lot, and by a lot, we mean the king's struggle with his drug addiction. Elvis's drug abuse wasn't pretty. The man went from a hunk to an overweight man without that spunk, that fire that made him dazzle the audience. In David's book, My Brother Elvis, The Final Years, the gory details of the abuse came to light. It turned out that the king would have died earlier if it wasn't for the timely intervention of David. According to him, he was the bodyguard in a different sense of the word. David's role was to protect Elvis from himself. David claimed that his duty was to watch Elvis around the clock since he was taking so many pills that he spent more time completely obliterated than not. David had to note the medicines Elvis used and their combinations made into a pack. David Presley called these packs attack packs. A pack had about 11 pills maximum and a minimum of 6 pills, including an injection. The king had more than three of those combinations of substances. So David knew about the combination of pills, and he may have had a hand in preparing those combinations, but all of these are just conjectures. Even if David did know, there was nothing he could have done to stop his older brother. He was just 16 when he was playing his bodyguard role, so he had little authority over what Elvis did. Or did he? Still, he should have known something was wrong in those times he had to physically reach into Elvis's throat to remove food when the drugs kicked in while he was still eating. So, while he could do nothing to stop Elvis from his addiction, he wrote about his experience with Elvis during those periods, when his addiction was an all-time high. It looked like he was trying to profit from his brother's addiction. He wasn't the only one. Five core members of the Mafia did the same, but they were not pretentious about their reasons after a huge controversy erupted from their decision to make a documentary from the memoirs they wrote. They titled the documentary, Elvis, All the King's Men. The world was disappointed with Elvis's cousin Billy Smith and the others, Marty Lacker, Lamar Fike, Red and Sonny West. We suppose we can cut them some slack for their honesty, but it doesn't make it right. They made money from Elvis when he was alive. They got more than money even. They had fame, cars, houses and other things that made life enjoyable. Lamar Fike and Sonny West met a president of the United States. They got White House brooches for their wives on that visit. Billy too. Billy was in the Mafia before all the other people in their crew. The Mafia was the inner circle, but Billy Smith, Presley's cousin from his mother's side, was the closest to him. He was the one that remained when the others had left. Their bond was so strong that they had a pledge between them. The pledge was so sacred, so strong, that Billy didn't reveal the details even after Elvis's death, although he claimed Elvis later told someone else the pledge. But that wasn't surprising. Elvis was terrible with secrets, and the whole gang knew. However, Bill vouched that this didn't mean Elvis was a tattletale. The pledge came to be in one of the later-known Elvis death experiences, a slip and fall in the bathroom which gave the king a concussion. The two committed the pledge to memory, and Billy was so gracious to give the first few lines. It's just a simple word, you see. To get inside you need no key. For we who know, know it well and you who don't can never tell. As I place my hand upon your heart, and you place yours on mine, from this day forward our minds, our souls, our hearts will intertwine. So with their bond and closeness to Elvis, it's amazing that these guys felt it was a good idea to make a documentary. 
When the world lit them up with criticisms, they claimed they wanted to clear the air on some things. How convenient. Their clearing of the air should have been limited to their involvement with Elvis's addiction, why Elvis continued to play in Las Vegas despite hating it so much. Instead of limiting it to those things, they talked about Elvis's marriage to Priscilla and all but called it a sham. Come on, guys, that's low, pretty low. That kind of stuff is something that should have stayed between the guys and Elvis. How can Billy make a pledge with Elvis, claim when it really mattered Elvis wouldn't betray him, and just sit among people who made such a revelation about Elvis's closely guarded secret? If it's even a secret, that is. After all, we can't confirm if anything they say was from Elvis himself. Marty Lacker was the one who mentioned that Elvis revealed this to him. Lacker went down to it and revealed Presley only married Priscilla because of a threat hanging over his head. Priscilla's father threatened to sue Elvis for breaching his promise to marry his daughter, who Presley met when she was in her early teens. Lacker claimed Elvis was forced to marry Priscilla and would rather continue to be a ladies' man. Lacker revealed Elvis had to ask Colonel Tom Parker what he should do about the marriage. Parker had ensured that he killed Elvis's previous relationship to keep the King's female fans interested in the King's music. Parker signed off on the marriage, and soon enough Elvis married the raven-haired Priscilla. It gets darker. Elvis wasn't a loyal man, not by half. He had women throwing themselves at him, said Lacker, and we all know this to be true. So despite his marriage to Priscilla, the man fooled around some and more. Soon enough, Priscilla had had enough, leaving Elvis for someone far beneath Elvis in station, karate teacher Mike Stone. The king wasn't amused. Lacker said despite having many affairs, it hurt his ego that Priscilla left him for a man that taught karate. He claimed Elvis's jealousy drove him to request that Stone be killed. Sonny West said Elvis came to meet him to off Stone, and he didn't come once. He went to Sonny repeatedly, even handing him an M16, which he would use to do the deed. Sonny revealed he'd dropped the gun, but Elvis wouldn't let him be, and even recruited Red West, his cousin. When Red finally told Elvis to give the word, Elvis didn't, Sonny said. At that point, Elvis told him to hold off. Deep down, he knew he had no right to have a hitman kill Stone. The West men absolved themselves of the responsibility for Elvis's death. They claimed the king kicked them out of Graceland because they were trying to interfere with how much the substances were damaging him. Lamar Fike revealed the pills were something they all took at some point, but while other people stopped their use, Elvis was convinced he wasn't breaking any law. Drugs to Elvis meant marijuana, cocaine or heroin. Since he got these prescriptions from doctors, he was convinced he wasn't doing anything wrong. So the two Wests claimed to swap out his medication, but the scheme didn't work as Presley didn't get his usual kick from them. Then they claimed to have threatened to turn in the people bringing those elixirs to Elvis, but when Elvis heard, he was furious with them. He warned them to stay off his business, and six months later, he fired them. The guys blamed Parker and believed he was the one that pushed Elvis to his death with his selfishness. First, Parker knew what his charge was up to, but he didn't care as long as Presley did what was needed to be done, make money. If Parker had told Elvis to keep off those drugs, he would have. Such was the influence Parker had on Elvis. After all, despite being depressed in Vegas, Elvis continued to perform there, and according to the guys, he complained about it. The pressure of his recurrent Vegas performances may have doubled his reliance on his potions. The men also felt if Parker weren't an illegal alien and Presley had gone on the European tour, he would still live longer. But after discussing Parker's part, they went on to give details of Elvis's death, and even if they didn't mean it that way, it looked like mockery. They said Elvis died from suffocation as he passed out on the thick carpet of the bathroom. It is a detail people didn't need to know, and which dishonoured Presley's memory. If he had moved it to the side, he would have been breathing and wouldn't have died, Sonny said. Wow, they spent the best part of their lives with Elvis, and they just said that without remorse. Well, anything to sell the documentary? These guys even mentioned Elvis's struggle to lose weight. It is not a secret that Presley also wanted to become an actor, but after 31 films in 13 years, with each newer script worse than the last, the hip-thrusting rock-and-roll genius gave up. 
According to the guys, an opportunity came for Presley to make a comeback in the film A Star Is Born, but it would require the rock and roll king to lose some pounds. Presley was excited about the role and he tried to lose weight, but he couldn't, so the role went to someone else. For people who were around Elvis and, to a certain extent, failed him when he needed them the most, doing a documentary detailing the sadder aspects of the king's life like that, for money, screams one thing. Parasites. The guys were parasites. It's interesting, they blamed Parker for what they were guilty of. Sometimes we wonder if they secretly resented Elvis for his success. Maybe, after all this while, they felt he didn't deserve it. Despite the fact that Elvis was betrayed by his best friends and even more family members, he has an extraordinary relationship with one person. Did Elvis Presley have a healthy relationship with his daughter, Lisa Marie, 